John chapter 11. If you're there, uh, this is our, our second week in John chapter 11, and I normally would try to take it really quick and go through it as fast as I can, but, you know, um, that's just, we're doing it verse by verse. That's, that's how I do it. You'll notice that I'm bruised today. My wife beat me this week. Uh, no, I'm just, no, don't clap for, what are you clapping? Who? Mm, don't mouth off to Andrea. That's words of wisdom for you all. So, John chapter 11, we're going to start in verse 17 this morning. And we're going to go to verse 44. Uh, I'm reading out the New Living Translation. If you have a phone or a tablet and you want to switch over to the New Living Translation, you can uh, pick up how and follow along with me. So when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in, the, in his grave for four days. <clears throat> Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Mary and Martha in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. Uh-oh. Uh, but, Martha, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus when she got to Jesus, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in this conversation because I have a feeling that Martha, um, she just let her rip. Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will uh, rise when everyone else rises at the last day. And Jesus told her in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary. She called Mary aside from the mourners and told her, The teacher is here and he wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to him. Jesus had stayed outside the village at a place where Martha met him. When the people who were at the house consoling Mary saw her leave so hastily, they assumed that she was going to Lazarus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet. Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other wailing, wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him. And he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked. And they told him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And the people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him? But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. A cave with a stone rolled across the entrance. Roll the stone aside, Jesus told them. But Martha, the dead man's sister, protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days, and the smell will be terrible. Jesus responded, Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I say it out loud for the sake of all those people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in head cloth. Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Father, we thank you for your word today, and we ask that you would help us as we study it today, that it would apply it to our lives. It's in Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. There is a famous New York Yankees baseball player who had some of the most crazy and incredibly quoted lines. Even some of, some of the lines that he said were used by presidents like Ronald Reagan, George Bush, even Bill Clinton. Clinton, and he, he's known as saying some very strange things. He said things like this. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. You can observe, you can observe a lot by just watching. 
He said, we made too many wrong mistakes. No one goes there nowadays because it's too crowded. Pair up into threes. Um, you've got to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. The future ain't what it used to be. 90% of the game is half mental. It gets late early out there. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. And there's one of his most famous sayings is, I never said most of the things I said. <laughs> Sounds like a politician. <clears throat> but the most famous thing that this Yankee ball player is known for saying, and the thing that is quoted more often by anybody, and I've actually even heard it already this morning, it ain't over till it's over. Anybody know who the ball player is I'm talking about? Yogi Berra, absolutely. A uh, very odd person and says some incredibly good things. I'm going to give you 10 points today just because I can. The points mean nothing and you cannot redeem them anywhere. So hold on to them. They might be worth some someday. Now I want to point out to you, and, and this is a... Um, before you begin to think that this sermon is based upon what is going on in our world right now. This message was put, I, this was planned way before I even had election thoughts or anything that's going on. So don't jump to conclusions that pastor's preaching about the election and the results and all that stuff. Because I am not preaching about that. If the Holy Spirit uses that to speak to you, that's up to you and the Holy Spirit. But this is all about the story of Lazarus. It ain't over till it's over. Great Yogi Berra quote. Today, we are focused on uh, what God is doing and going to do, especially when there seems to be no hope. Um, when there seems no way out, when you are in a place of pain and sorrow, when the chips are down and everything seems the darkest, no hope, no way, no chance, it's completely over. It is the perfect place for God to work. It is the soil that God uses to grow incredible things. And can I remind you that the same God who opened the sea for the children of Israel and stopped the army of, of the Egyptians, the same God who protected those three faithful Hebrew children while they were in a fiery furnace, the same God who let Daniel sleep overnight in a den of lions, hungry lions, the same God who used the silence of a tomb to bring what seems completely impossible out of it. We serve that exact same God today and He has not changed at all. That's just the God that we serve. Last week we talked about a couple of things and I wanted to point out the principles that we, the, the thoughts from last week were that the presence of problems does not signal the absence of God. When our faith is tested, it is not a denial of God's love. God, when God seems to be inactive, it's always for a greater purpose. Remember, we get the little snapshot, but God works on a canvas as big as the universe. When God seems to be completely inactive, it's always for that greater purpose. What the enemy meant for evil, God uses it for good. And today... As we continue in our story about Lazarus, these are the things that I want you to see from this story. God's timetable, I want you to think about this. God's timetable is not our timetable. God's desire is for us to be involved in his plan. We are not we're not spectators. We don't just sit on the bench. He wants us to be participants in what He is doing. That's God's desire for each one of us. We don't just sit on the sidelines. We, we are involved in what God has going on. Jesus calls us to trust Him when all hope is gone. Jesus can handle our frustrations and our disappointments. In fact, He feels the weight of sin and pain with us. But the biggest thing is that we get from today is that it ain't over till it's over. Where the world puts a period, where sin puts a period, where the devil puts a period, God removes it and puts a comma because he is not done. 
The Bible has never been more relevant to us than it is right now, today in our, our, our day. When Jesus comes to Bethany, remember, Jesus has been hounded by these religious leaders because they want to kill him. And Jesus knows that when he goes to Bethany, the chances of him getting caught in Bethany are very high. So Jesus travels down south to Bethany, which is about two miles outside of Jerusalem. So Jesus is getting really close to some big danger. And Jesus knows that what he's going to do with Lazarus, we've already read the story that Lazarus comes back from the dead. Spoiler alert for anybody that wasn't paying attention. That's what happens. A dead man who had been dead for four days comes back to life. All by the words that came out of Jesus' mouth. And the, the thing that I find interesting is that when God does something like this, there are always people that will criticize, and it is exactly the, the thing that leads Jesus to the cross. They even try to, they, they have plans, and we'll hear about this next week, more next week. They have plans to kill the very man that Jesus just rose from the dead to try to prove that Jesus did not raise him from the dead. So Jesus knew that he was already dead for four days. Verse 18 tells us that Bethany was only a few miles, two miles away from Jerusalem, from the city where people are, are looking for Jesus. And there is a funeral that is happening in this town of Bethany. And I'm going to paint a picture for you because I'm a visual person. I'm, that's how I learn. I'm a visual learner. Uh, it's hard for me to read and focus because I have uh, ADD on, on a level that is just outrageous. And so when I'm studying things, I cannot have anything in my peripheral vision. If I do, if the car pulls up and the light flashes, like that's, that's just how I am. So I want to paint a picture for you of what this would, what Jesus is going to be walking into. Now, funerals for us in America are are are, are kind of different than that, what they were back in those days. Um, funerals today are these quiet events. You dress up extremely nice. I mean, that's when people dust off their, their nice shoes and their nice outfits. And that's when, the, you know, it's either weddings or funerals, which is weird because you dress up for both of those things. And they're kind of, there's a dying in some things. I'm not, my wife's not here today, so I can say what I want to. People are quiet. They whisper. Soft organ or piano music is played. There's usually a sign outside, especially when you go to, to funeral homes, so please be quiet, please silence your cell phones, we, you know, no loud noises, no, no anything to, to disturb the family that is, that is grieving. The family gets private time. They're very, they're very pulled off to the side. They even have, in some places, they have moments where you can be with your loved one that has passed away, and you can go and you can you know, say your final goodbyes, and then they open it up for everyone. But the Jewish funerals are extremely different. I mean, polar opposite to what we know as our funerals today. You came to a funeral and you expressed your grief loudly uh, by shrieking and howling at these funerals. Uh, it was required for you to tear your clothes. So you chose the worst clothes you had and you would rip your clothes and, and to, to signal to everyone that you were in grief, uh, in grief-stricken mode. You would sometimes wear sackcloth or uh, imagine like a, a potato bag for clothing that would be the worst of the worst. You'd roll it around in dirt a little bit, maybe even put dirt on your face and on your body so that people would know that you were sad. Uh, if you were wealthy, you had makeup artists that would come in and would make your face sad for you um, just in case you were trying to convince somebody that you were sad and when the person that died, you... Mm. It was required for you to tear your clothes. And in our funeral, that's exactly the opposite because you dress up nicely. And when people, uh, that's usually they break out the ties and the dress shoes and that kind of thing. In the Jewish culture, they had 39 religious regulations of how to tear your clothes at a funeral. This is one of them. Uh, 
For example, if you are closely related to the individual that has passed away, you tear your clothes up higher, more so above your heart, about the size of your fist that you could put a fist through. And you would wear those same clothes for 30 days. Yeah. Might be a funeral after those 30 days of wearing those nasty clothes. And you would walk around and people and you wanted people to see that you were in mourning. You people would, oh, they would see you so sad and looking looking depressed and looking disgusting, and they would know that you were in mourning. And for seven days, the first seven days of the funeral, it was one of those things where people would come, you would have professional whalers. Not like the ones that kill whales. Whalers, like mourners. And they would, you would pay people to come to a funeral to kind of like prime the pump, get everybody emotional. <sighs> like you, and, they had, and they were paid well to do what they did. In fact, even the poorest individual's funeral had at least two flutes and one wailing woman. It was required. One wailing woman, two flutes. And what they would they would play these sad dirges, they called them. And they were just like this, this monotoned tone that would just depress everybody. Just to set the mood, set the tone for, for the grief that you were feeling. And, it, and you know how, so, you know, nowadays you kind of give people space. You didn't do that back in those days. Like you sat across from somebody and stared at them in solidarity with their moaning so that they would know that you're right there with them. If you got up to go outside, they would get up to go and follow you outside, m like wailing and moaning the whole time, loudly. I mean, it's like uncomfortable. That just, to me, that just gives me like, ugh, I don't know. But this is the scene that, that, that Jesus is walking into. This is the kind of scene that Jesus is coming to. But when, when Martha hears that Jesus is on his way and he's coming there, Martha, you remember, she has this... Uh, how do I put it nicely? Uh, overbearing personality. That sounds about right. She was, when Mary and Martha were at, the, at supper with Jesus and Martha is working hard in the kitchen and Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet, she comes to Jesus, she's like, now look here, Jesus. She probably whipped her hair. Look here, Jesus. Mary needs to be in the kitchen with me, helping me do the work for this meal. So you better, get, you better tell her to get in that kitchen and help me do this, what needs to be done. And Jesus says, hey, hold up, Martha. Mary has picked the right thing. She's, she needs to be sitting in my feet. In fact, Martha, you can lose the attitude and come sit at my feet too. He didn't say that. He probably thought it, but he didn't say it because he didn't want to get spit in his food. <laughs> So Martha, she hears that Jesus is coming, and no doubt she hears it from the person that she sent a message to Jesus that Lazarus was dying. And this, this person brings back the message that, hey, Jesus is in town. Jesus is coming to your house. And Martha's like, I ain't waiting for him to come. I'm about to go out there. I'm going to tell him what I think about what he should have done. That's Martha. Like stomping. Just like... I'm, I'm telling, like, talking to herself. You know, you men, come on, we know. I'm going to tell him, you, you tell me, why, he should have been here when I told him to be here. He should, how should it work? He doesn't know what I'm, I'm just, come on. Just, all the way there to Jesus. And this is what she says. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What's the next word? But... It's like she, she catches herself in her attitude. But, even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Now, now a lot of people say, M Martha was not shy at all about how she felt about things. 
And, and this is where most people in a lot of the commentaries I read this week said, this is probably where Mary or Martha believed that, that Jesus could raise Lazarus from the dead. And that's not true. Because Martha even says at the graveside, she says, God, he's, Jesus, he stinks. He's, he's been there for four days. Do not open that door. This is the moment where Martha, it's not that she thinks Jesus is going to raise him from the dead again. This is the moment where Martha says, my brother has died. Yes, I think you should have been here. But, I still trust, I still believe that you are in communication with God. And even though I don't feel happy in this moment, I believe and I know in who, who you really are. My thing is that people can, anyone can believe and have faith when the sun is shining, the bank account is full, the job is going great, the bills are paid, the fridge is full, family is healthy. But true faith, very dangerous faith, believes even when everything is falling apart. No matter how thin of a hope that you have. So Jesus tells her in verse 23, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. I understand that. Mar Martha knew her theology. She knew it well. She knew that there was one day going to be a resurrection of the dead. It was one of those things that had been talked about in their culture and their, in their religion. But Jesus tells her, he says, no, 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 no. It's not someday. He says in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. <laughs> now, now, I want you to notice something. Jesus doesn't say, Jesus doesn't say, no, I have the resurrection and I have the life, or I will have the resurrection and the life. Not someday I will be the resurrection and the life. He says, I am right now the resurrection and the life. Anyone, anyone who believes in me, even though they die, their physical body, even though they die, they live. That's like fact. Jesus is like, no, and Mary, Martha, it's not going to be someday I am right now the resurrection and the life. Now check, check this, what he says in verse 26. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Hello? Did you catch that first part? Because, I mean, we always just focus on the believe part, like anybody who believes in me. No, no, what did Jesus say? Everyone who lives in me, you know what that means? That means relationship. Hello? That means relationship. And what that means is you are living in relationship with Christ. And when you live in relationship with Christ, He can tell you things about you that can fix things that are in your heart. But you can't know, you can't have them fixed unless you live in Him. Believing doesn't mean anything. It is hogwash, as we say down south. It is, it is worthless unless you live and believe. You cannot miss that first part. And we skip over that all the time to get to the believe. Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I believe. No, but do you live and believe? Big difference. But Jesus puts her on the spot. Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe it? You see, it, it is the profession of faith that is essential to the Christian life and to the Christian walk. That is essential to your faith, to your Christian walk, that you profess that Jesus is your Lord. And he, Jesus was asking Martha, Martha, do you believe this? Or is this just something you think you believe? Do you actually believe it? That's why when we ask somebody, to, when they come to Christ, they, they tell somebody else about what Jesus has done inside of them. It is a profession of your faith. 
to say, I believe, this is what I believe. Verse 27, Martha is not afraid. Yes, Lord, I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. Man, she gets her, the she nails the theology. I think she's a little fired up. Because guess what she's fixing to do? She's, she's fixing to go tell Mary that she needs to come and see Jesus. Verse 28. She comes to Mary. She pulls her aside from the mourners and told her, the teacher is here and he wants to see you. You see, these two, these two girls have been, they've been, they've been struggling for a couple days. Why isn't Jesus here? Why hasn't he shown up when he's supposed to show up? Well, he should have been here kind of thing. They've been talking about this because you're going to see they share notes here in just a second. She pulls Mary away from the other mourners in the crowd and she whispers to, to, to Mary because Mary is one of these, she's an emotional person and she needs to hear this from Jesus himself. Martha does something, and something interesting. She calls Jesus the teacher here. You realize that rabbis never taught women? Like rabbis in this, they didn't think women could understand or learn or comprehend, and so they wouldn't teach them, but guess who taught them? Jesus is like, I'll take the ones that nobody wants. I'll take them. So, so when we think that women can't be in ministry... Hogwash is what that's a word you need to put in your vocabulary, please. So Mary immediately went to him outside of town, trying to, you know, keep out of town. When the people in the house, they, they, they were consoling Mary. Remember, when you're at a funeral and those, somebody has died and, and you sit there with that person and you stare at them for a week, everywhere they go, you go. Because you're going to console them, you're right there with them. They think Mary is going out to, to Lazarus' gravesite to weep and to mourn. But no, Mary's like, there's a different spirit about her. She's on her way to see Jesus because she knows that there's no other hope that is found. And if we don't know that, then we need to know that. Mary arrives and saw Jesus. She fell at, her, at his feet. That's just, that's Mary. She's not the, hey, look here, Jesus. You should, no, that's not Mary. Mary just falls down and, at his feet and begins to cry. And look what she says. Her and, her and Martha have been sharing notes. Obviously, they've been saying this to each other all week. Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. They've been, I mean, they've been saying that back and forth to each other all week long. If Jesus had been here, oh, well, I know. Totally different if Jesus was in, on the scene. But I want you to see verse 33. Jesus says, it says that when Jesus saw her weeping and he saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up in him. Now, I have the ability to go into a program in my computer and I can, I can go back and look and see how this was originally written. And I don't, I'm not smart enough to read Greek and Hebrew. But there's a thing in there that says, hey, you want to click it to this and you click it and it says, hey, this is what it says in Hebrew and Greek. You want to know what it says there? Jesus snorted like a horse. <laughs> yeah. He snorts like a horse. He's angry. Now you think, oh man, Jesus is angry at Mary and Martha and angry about all this? No. There's a to totally different anger that he's feeling. It's not an anger towards them. It's an anger towards sin and death. I want you to understand something. Jesus, when he, when he was a part of creation and part of making us and making everything that we see here... Jesus has a vested interest in us because inside of each and every one of us, inside of every person on planet earth, God has stamped the Imago Dei, which is the image of God on each one of us. So in li living inside of each one of you, each one of you is the image of God that is stamped inside of you. And when, when sin came into the world, when, when Adam and Eve sinned and it came into the world, it destroyed the creation that God made and loved so much. 
and death and cancers and sin and all those things came into this world that God had created, this perfect, beautiful world. And he knew that when that happened, it was going to come into each one of us, into the Imago Day life that we have. I, I tell everybody all the time, I'm like, you realize that every person on planet Earth has the Imago Day stamped within them. President Trump has it. Uh, Joe Biden has it. Kamala Harris has it. They all have that Imago Day stamped in them. So we cannot hate people like that because the image of God is stamped on them. What Jesus is angry about is this. He is angry because he sees what sin does to what he loves so much. He's not angry at them for being sad. He is not angry at them for being upset, for being frustrated. Jesus welcomes those feelings, those frustrations, those angry feelings that you have sometimes that well up inside of you and you just like you're about to explode. Those are the things you take to God. You take to Christ. He handles those things well because you, you have it in you. He already knows it. You might as well tell him. I don't know how many times I've had to have really candid conversations with God. Like, why are you not doing something? I think I've said this before, but it was one of the times when a teenager in our church was driving home after church one Wednesday night from our youth group Christmas party, and he dies in a car accident on the way home from our church youth group. Instantly killed. I had never met his family, his parents, or anything before that night. And I remember driving to the scene of the accident at four in the morning. And there was this... I wasn't... There was just something in me. And I, I felt something say to me, to let it out, man. Go ahead and tell me. Tell me how you feel. So the ride all the way to the scene of the accident where Daniel was dead, all the way there, God heard tears and anger and yelling. I mean, I was screaming at him. Why would you let this kind of thing happen? Why? You could have stopped it. His parents don't deserve that. That kid's an awesome kid. Why would you do that? I mean, bro I mean, I was I was in one of those modes where I was like, "You're just going to hear my heart, Jesus. That's all it is." You know, Jesus loves it when we speak to Him from our hearts and we tell Him how we feel. He's not angry with Mary or the grievers or the mourners. No, He's not angry at them. He sees the result that sin has caused, and not just to the entire world, but to the ones that He has this personal relationship with. He sees now, and He's known it, but this is hits hard and hits home for Jesus. The writer of Hebrews chapter 4 says, We don't have a high priest, meaning Jesus. We don't have a high priest who doesn't understand and sympathize with us. He is moved by the feelings of the things that bother us. That's the God we serve. We serve a God who is moved when we are moved. When He cries, when we cry. He is angry when we are angry. That's just how God is. And when things are not fair, and when things don't seem like they're working out... He wants to have that conversation. You don't pull back from Him. You run to Him when you have those moments. Because that's what He wants to hear. He wants to hear from your heart. He wants to know the anger. He wants to know the hurt. He wants to know the pain. Don't cover it up. Jesus says in verse 34, where have you put Him? It's like He's ready, man. And Jesus is in, he's in focus mode. So they told him, they said, let's, let's go. Come on, Jesus will take you to see where he is. In verse 35, we have it. The verse that all of us can memorize right now. Shortest verse in the Bible. At least you can say, I got this one. Jesus wept. That's it, man. You know it now, okay? You can get a cookie as you leave today because you've learned a verse and you've memorized that verse. Everybody can say it together, or you cannot, or whatever you'd like to do. Jesus wept. That is the... 
I want, you, I want you to see something. Everybody else is crying, yes? And crying, the words that they're using there is they're sobbing. Jesus is not sobbing. This is one of those emotional things. You ever just had a, a moment where you've cried, but there's no, nothing comes out but just tears? Just tears. Jesus did that. The people who were standing by, they said, man, look how, see how much he loved him. But then there were other people, of course, there's always those that are asking and skeptical questions and they mouth off. This man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Absolutely he could have. But that was not God's plan. Jesus, verse 38, Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. It would be a cave, hollowed out cave, that inside the cave there were different levels and layers. There would be a slab in the middle of the room that they would put the body on. Once the body had, had gone and rotted, decomposed enough, they would gather the bones together and put them on a shelf inside of the, the tomb. And then they would just keep reusing the tomb over and over again. And it would just be a place where your family was all buried. Verse 39, Jesus says, roll the stone aside. Now, now, this was one of those things that this week I'm th thinking, okay, now why didn't Jesus use his Jedi powers and just pick up that stone and throw it away? Why did Jesus ask people that were there, why did Jesus ask them to move the stone? Maybe he wasn't feeling it. Maybe he wasn't. No. Jesus' desire is to use us humans for what we can do. So we can depend on Jesus to do what we cannot do. And there's a lot of things we can't do. As much as I would love to call people back that I love and you love from the dead and, and stop your heart from hurting when I see you hurt, I can't do that. But what I can do is I can pull the stone away so Jesus can get in to do what he needs to do. Jesus could have moved that stone. It wouldn't have been a problem for him. I mean, bringing back somebody from the dead, why couldn't he have moved the stone? Well, he did it because... He wanted participation from those that are around. He wants participation from each one of us. It is our job as believers to open the grave for those that are dead in their sins so that Jesus can call them out. We all have those people in our lives that are buried under the weight of sin. They're buried under the weight of shame and sin and all those things. And sometimes Jesus calls us to pull that stone back so that He can speak into their heart, into their life, and call them out of the grave. Maybe Jesus is waiting for you to pull back a stone for somebody, call them out of their spiritual deadness and into life. But look what, Mar what Martha says. Oh, Martha, she's always thinking... Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. In your King James Bibles, it says, he stinketh. We used to say that about our teenagers, our middle schoolers, because they don't know what deodorant is. When I was a youth pastor, we would say, he stinketh. And all the girls would be like, mm-hmm. <clears throat> this is what Jesus says to, Mary, to Martha. Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believed? So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up into heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. This is, he's praying this out loud. Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me. But I'm saying it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. You know, I did some research this week, and I'm telling you right now, I did it for you not to have to do it. I googled what would happen to a body after de being dead for four days uh, with, with none of the chemicals that we use today in a hot atmosphere uh, in the Middle East where there is extreme heat. I googled that for you. You're, you're welcome um, that I had to do that for you. Uh, you don't have to do that, and I'm asking you not to do that. That was... 
It's gross. It, it is uh, disturbing and gross. Um, I'll just give you a glimpse. By this time, four days into it, there would be a... Uh, how do I put this? Uh, I'm just going to say it. There would be a greenish-brown ooze coming out of the body. All the cells and organs have died, and there bego begins to be this decomposition inside the body that happens, and then it's bloated, and it's got to go somewhere. Yeah. I should have had barf bags today, shouldn't I? I had barf bags sitting in. Should have. There's this, there's this goo that's coming out of Lazarus. That's as far as I'm going. You're welcome. Now, we talked about last week how God's timetable, like God does things in order, in the way that He does things, and there's a whole reason behind that. Jesus says to His Father, you always hear me, but I'm, I'm saying it out loud for the sake of these people standing here so that they will believe you sent me. And Jesus shouted. This is, a, this is Jesus yelling at the top of His lungs. This is not, hey Lazarus, come on out. No, that is not what Jesus is doing. Jesus yells, and I'm not going to do it. Jesus yells, Lazarus, come out. Now, he, he says specifically Lazarus because Jesus has so much power that if he would have said, just come out, all of the people that had ever died would have come back to life. And he's like, y'all, just stay back. I'm only calling this one. No, not yet. Lazarus. Lazarus was like, huh? Huh? Call me. Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. How would the guy see? I guess he's going towards the light, wherever the light is. He's like, I got to go towards that. I mean, do you realize the impossible thing that just happened? I mean, there is literally fluids oozing out of this man's body that has been dead for four days. And Jesus completely, in an instant, with, with just saying, Lazarus, come out, everything goes completely backwards. The impossibility of that happening and, and Lazarus being able to not only get up after being completely bound, I'm sure he was hopping out of the grave because he was bound, his feet were put together, his hands were at his side, his face was covered. He's like... Easter bunny hip hoppity out the grave. And this is what Jesus says to him. Unwrap him and let him go. Now Jesus could have, like I said before, Jesus could have done the unwrapping, you know, mind trick, Jedi mind trick, whatever, and unwrapped Lazarus. But Jesus called the people around Lazarus to unwrap him from his grave clothes. So what's our response for this today? We have to realize that, God, that, that, that God's timetable is not our timetable. God's desire for us is to be involved in His plan. He wants to use us in doing His work. God doesn't want us to just be spectators, to sit on the sidelines while He does what He does, and we don't have to do anything. No, God calls us to do things as well to be participants. There are way too many people that just sit on the side, on the bench at church and, not, and don't do anything for the glory of God. Now I want to tell you why Jesus waited four days. There was a belief in the Jewish culture that the spirit of a deceased person would hang around the body for four days, would circle around the body for four days looking for a way, that spirit was looking for a way to get back into the body. But by day four, there was such a decomposition that would happen to that body, the spirit would see that and say, there's no way I can get back into this body, and the spirit would completely leave. Now that's what they believed, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But this was Jesus saying, I'm waiting till there is absolutely no hope. There's, by, by the fourth day, there is no hope of resurrection at all. No chance whatsoever that this guy's coming back. Spirit is gone. Decomposition is happening. That's why Jesus waited four days. 
because he didn't want anybody to doubt. You see, back when Jesus heals Jairus' daughter, and remember they said, oh, she's asleep. That's how Jesus... No, Jesus didn't want any doubts about this resurrection. Why does God wait? Because when there is no hope left, when everything else has failed, hope walks into Bethany. And He calls our names, brings us out from death into life. That's the Jesus we serve. That's the Jesus that we serve. Father, we thank you for this day. We love this message of Lazarus. <laughs> all hope is gone. All hope is faded. There is no chance of this man coming back. And then, Jesus, you walk into town and completely reverse every cycle of death that has ever been. There were tears shed. There were moments that seemed hopeless. I guarantee you there are people in this room that have felt those hopeless feelings before. But then, on the last moment, you come in and blow our minds with the ability to do what seems to be utterly impossible. We ask that you would do that in our lives today, Jesus. If there's anybody here this morning that is living dead in your sins, I'm asking you to let Jesus call you out of that life into glorious freedom to salvation. You do not have to live in bondage to sin any longer. Death has no hold over you. The grave has not won. Satan has no power because you are bought with the blood of Jesus. We love you today, Jesus. We ask that you would help us as we go this week to be encouraged, to know that when you speak, it ain't over till it's over. And when you move, the earth trembles and shakes because of the powerful King that we serve. It's in the powerful name of that one that called Lazarus out of the grave that I'm praying this today. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.